Hello and welcome to Solar Alberta's 2024 Solar Series. Today's session is called Solar Across the Americas, Solar Principles in North and South America. We were delighted to have so many people register for this event. Please note that we will be recording this webinar for future distribution. My name is Heather McKenzie and I'm the Executive Director at Solar Alberta. I would like to take a minute to acknowledge that I'm hosting you today and working day to day from Amiskwichewaskahagen, also known as Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, which is located on Treaty 6 territory and the homelands of the Métis Nation. Treaty 6 territory is the traditional gathering place and home of many Indigenous peoples, including the Papaches, Cree, Soto, Dene, Blackfoot, and Nakota Sioux, nations whose ancestors have cared for and nurtured these lands since time immemorial. Today, we'll be hearing from Marcus Lehman and Dr. Sarah Hastings Simons in a robust discussion format. To close the event, there will be a question and answer period in which you can all participate. We're going to be using Zoom Q&A for questions rather than the chat box. So please enter your questions in the Q&A section. And I'll ask that you spell out your acronyms, please, as those can be a bit confusing. Also, please click on the little thumbs up symbol to upvote questions that you like. The entire session will wrap up in an hour and a half. In an effort to increase accessibility to the content we are offering, we have enabled closed captioning for this presentation. You can turn the captioning on in the toolbar at the bottom of your Zoom screen. During our Q&A period, we will be using Zoom Q&A for questions. Oops, I already covered that. Before we move forward, uh, just gonna do a quick poll to get a sense of who we have joining us today. Please take a minute to answer the questions that are popping up on your screen now. <clears throat> and while some are still doing the poll, I just want to encourage you to also take a minute, pop your name, land acknowledgement, any contact info that you're comfortable in uh, sharing in the chat now and throughout the event uh, so that others can look you up on LinkedIn or email you and hopefully relationships can be formed. Alrighty, thank you for completing the poll. Let's see those results. Here we are. Oh, lots of solar curious folks in the house. I can't say I'm surprised because one of the reasons we hosted this session is because I too am very curious about this topic. Uh, we definitely have uh, solar industry folks here. Welcome if you're members, if you're not, you're welcome as well. And some students, so thanks for joining us. I don't doubt the students who are here might be Dr. Hastings Simon students, so welcome if you are. And it looks like a good chunk of you might be coming to the solar show next week, so that's exciting as well. Thank you very much for participating. It's always helpful to know a little bit about the audience before we dive in. And now I'm just going to talk a little bit about Solar Alberta. Did you know this is actually our 33rd year of operation? Albertans have been excited about solar energy for quite a while. We're a nonprofit society that is dedicated to accelerating Alberta's transition to a just and sustainable future. We do so by advocating, educating, and serving as an industry and community hub for solar energy. Our membership is made up of over 760 individuals and 170 businesses. We provide a number of services, including managing a solar directory through our website. In this way, we act as a bridge for installers, suppliers, and other solar-related businesses to connect with their customers and clients. You can see a screenshot of the directory here on this slide and a link to it in the chat. In addition to our website services, we run a number of educational programs, such as this solar seminar series and a number of in-person and online networking events each year over the lunch hour. Uh, we also host an annual online conference and trade show. Uh, it's called The Solar Show. It's happening next week, January 29th to February 2nd. You can register now as we are popping that link in the chat. We're excited to be offering sessions about solar ready design, solar for multifamily homes, hiring and recruiting in the solar sector. And I think our Solar 101 session is going to be the best attended session that we've ever hosted, as it looks like we're getting close to 300 registrations. So that's pretty amazing. Recordings of our previous solar show sessions can be found on our YouTube channel. This spring, we're going to be running a number of online courses for solar industry professionals or those transitioning into the sector. Our courses are online Tuesday and Thursday evenings on three to five nights over two to three weeks. First up is economics of grid tied solar PV 
which is great for anyone going into solar sales or marketing. Uh, you can already register for all of our courses now in the link in the chat. And for the first time ever, based on popular demand, we're offering a new buy three, get codes free bundle. So this bundle includes our four technical courses on the roster, solar, pre solar PV electrical codes, solar PV design and modeling, solar PV commissioning, operating and maintenance, and battery energy storage system design and modeling. And that's mostly for off-grid systems. Uh, that last one. The link to purchase the bundle is also available in the chat. Recordings of these courses are also available uh, for sale alongside our paid workshops in the solar training section of our website. In addition to providing education about solar, we also advocate for it. We have a number of different campaigns running currently, which include template letters that you can use to contact decision makers. So please join us, send some letters today requesting the Canada Greener Home Grant be refinanced as they're running out of money, requesting an end to the provincial moratorium on renewable power plants, and requesting a number of supports for solar and energy efficiency upgrades for homes and businesses in Alberta. In addition to our letter templates, which are pictured here on the web on the screen, we also have free Rise Up for Renewable lawn signs available for pickup in 11 municipalities across Alberta. Your support with our advocacy efforts is super important, so please click on the link in the chat to access all our templates and make a sign order today. And if you're not already, just want to encourage you to join Solar Alberta as a member. We are constantly evolving our service offerings, uh, some of which include discounts on our courses, workshops, access to member only content and much more. Membership for individuals is just $35 and you can purchase that at the link in the chat. If you're looking to support our work, uh, of course, you can consider volunteering or donating as well. And so uh, those options are also being made available in the chat. And without further ado, I'd like to take this opportunity to give a big shout out to Firefly Solar for sponsoring this year's seminar series as a whole. We really couldn't offer all of our amazing free content without the support of our sponsors. Uh, we're always interested in developing more partnerships for our events, and we even have a half a session sponsorship left for the Solar Show next week. Uh, so if you or your company want to work with us to educate the public about solar or solar related technologies, please don't hesitate to reach out. Now I'd like to welcome our sponsor for the session, who will share a little bit about Firefly Solar, and then he will introduce our speakers. Kyle, you're welcome to join me here on the screen and uh, and give your your intro. Welcome. Hi there, everybody. Uh, so my name is Kyle McCormick. I'm, uh, I'm one of the four founders and owners of Firefly Solar. And uh, at Firefly, we believe that renewable energy is the best path forward to a sustainable future. We specialize in both residential as well as CNI Solar. Our headquarters is based here in Calgary. Two of our four owners, myself and Colleen Beveridge, are born in Eastern Canada with our other two partners, Chris Nastassi and Chris Anderson, born here in Western Canada. This completes our growing footprint right now, ranging from Nova Scotia all the way to Vancouver Island and including 28 states in the USA. We complete several thousand projects a year and are growing aggressively. Our sister company, Kaiman Roofing, under the same ownership group, ensures a seamless solar integration that will not harm but actually enhance your roof. Our commitment to quality includes the following. A white glove experience, end-to-end -end transparent process where we prioritize customer service, speed, and efficiency. It's our privilege here at Firefly to, uh, to be a partner and, uh, and a sponsor of Solar Alberta this year. And uh, without further ado, I'll hand over the, uh, the mic to, uh, to our host. Thanks so much. Thank you, Kyle. I appreciate you being here. And I'm going to introduce our speakers now. So you're welcome to camera off, Kyle. And I will have Sarah and uh, Marcus camera on. So we have with us today our two speakers. We're gonna have a robust roundtable discussion. I'm just gonna turn my screen share off so that you can see our speakers and move my screen a little so I can see my speaking notes. There we go. So first up, we're gonna have Dr. Sarah Hastings Simons. She's an associate professor in the Department of Earth, Energy and Environment and School of Public Policy where she directs the Masters of Science in Sustainable Energy Development. And it doesn't say that here, but I think that's at the University of Calgary. So that's awesome. Uh, she is a macro energy system researcher and studies low carbon energy transitions at the intersections of policy, business and technology. 
Sarah is also co-host of Energy Versus Climate, a podcast that explores the energy transition in Alberta, Canada and beyond. So welcome, Sarah. Thanks for joining us for this conversation today. Thanks for having me. Great. And Marcus Lehman, president of Navigatio Capital, drives the company's investments in the America's new energy sector, focusing on assets like solar, wind and renewable hydrogen. His journey began in Calgary, moving from a farm background to a strategic role at the Danish Sovereign Wealth Fund, IFU. Through Navigatio, Marcus has sourced over 1 billion in equity for aggregate, aggregate energy projects, including Canada's largest renewable facility, the Travers Solar Farm. He also serves on the boards of the Institute for Emotional Intelligence and Project Play Africa. Previously involved with Solar Alberta, Marcus balances his professional achievements with family life and managing his own nine kilowatt ground mount solar and heat pump facilities on his acreage in Wheatland County. So welcome, Marcus. Thank you for joining us today. Such a pleasure to be here, Heather. Thanks. Yeah, wonderful. So I'm going to start off with a, a round of questions for you, and hopefully you'll have a couple for each other as well. And then I'll open the question and answer box to see what questions um, our audience has for you as well, because I'm sure they will be keen to ask you things. Uh, so just to begin, I'm just curious, and this is something I've been wondering about a lot. Um, we frequently hear comparisons uh, about, uh, you know, how the solar sector in Canada compares to Europe. So that I hear that a lot. Um, but what I rarely hear and what I'm very interested to learn from you today is how it compares to other parts of the Americas. So, you know, the US, Brazil and all those places around uh, North and South and Central America. So just wondering, um, maybe you could begin, Sarah, just to start explaining a little bit about how the solar systems elsewhere in the Americas compare to Alberta's. Um, what are some of the key differences uh, a lot of us really haven't had the opportunity to dig into that. So maybe I'll let you start, Sarah, and then Marcus, uh, you can touch, uh, add on what Sarah says there. Sounds good. Well, um, maybe I'll start by just sharing a bit of a snapshot of what um, the current state of solar looks like uh, close to home here in Alberta, because I think that um, really gives us a good sense of um, sort of the, the period of change that we're in. And I can talk a little bit about how that compares to what we have seen, um, particularly in, say, North America and, and in the States, um, which is where, where I'm more familiar, I think, um, from Marcus will hear as well about South America, which is a great comparator. Um, but what the graph that's hopefully showing up on your screen um, is, is showing is the total, the cumulative amount of utility scale solar, uh, so large scale um, uh, systems systems that we have in Alberta. And, um, you know, I, I look at this graph and of course, every time I update it, um, it, it looks even more striking, I think, than the time before. What's interesting about it is the dates along the bottom, they're a little bit small, but hopefully you can read them. Um, this graph only goes back to uh, kind of December of 2017. Um, and if you if I maybe go back even further that you would basically just have zero it's very slightly above zero during that time. Um, but I think it does a really good job of showing that the growth that we're seeing in solar in Alberta um, is a pretty recent phenomenon um, and, and pretty significant right on the, on the scale of the total um, generation capacity in the province, which is somewhere, you know, more or less around uh, 20,000 uh, megawatts on this scale. So um, this is a you know, kind of reflects what's happening in Alberta, which is a recent but significant growth of solar. Um, and when I compare that to um, North America and to the US and even to some of the other provinces across Canada, I think what we see is that we played a little bit of a catch up, if you want, in some ways. We were a bit slower to install solar um, in the province, um, and we're seeing it now at a larger scale. Um, and part of that is, you know, maybe due to the nature of the solar resource that we have here, which is, um, you know, quite good, best, certainly best place in Canada to be in Alberta and, and definitely comparable to some parts of the US, but of course not as some um, not we don't get as much as much sunlight as much energy from the sun as um, as some parts of the states do. Um, but I think also, you know, from a 
I, I, as you were saying in my intro, I think a lot about, um, you know, what drives adoption and what drives uptake. And so, um, you know, I think you, you sort of see in that graph a phenomenon of almost the province um, and, and the province as a whole, meaning, you know, all the, the competitive generators and others sort of almost discovering the potential. Um, and once that was discovered, that that became quite, uh, quite significant. Um, maybe one technical element uh, before I, I turn over to Marcus to kind of compare um, to other places or maybe two, two other observations, I guess I'll, I'll add. Um, one is that, interestingly, despite the fact that, that that growth came pretty late, we were one of the first places, um, Alberta, to actually have a significant amount of uh, bifacial solar panels. And so those are um, solar panels that basically have cells on both sides of them, the side that is facing the sun um, and on the backside, which you might say, well, that's weird. Why would you put you know, solar panels on the, on the backside um, that's not facing the sun? And the reason for that is that you can get reflections off the ground. Um, and it's um, again, sort of within the fact that those are getting used is a, is a broader important trend that the cost of those cells is coming down so much it's becoming so cheap to just make the cell part of that that even getting a little bit more um, capacity from that backside is actually you know makes economic sense um, and we have that happening in alberta one of the reasons this was an early place to see that is that it works quite well if you have a ground cover that is um, white that is going to be reflecting a lot of the light and of course what does that well the snow does that um, and so some of the ways that we we think about you know challenges maybe with um, with snow um, can also be opportunities um, for for uh, technology to be demonstrated and kind of proven out here. Um, in the meantime, now my understanding is this, this has become bifacial panels has become more common across the U.S. and there are even some sort of uh, trade uh, details and details of tariffs that that kind of played into that. Um, but but I think it's an interesting technological example. Um, Maybe just one last, uh, and then I'll then I'll pass it on. But um, when I think about um, our rooftop solar and our distributed solar, we do have a very different setup when it comes to the way that um, those systems are compensated in Alberta versus basically everywhere else um, across North America that I'm aware of, which is to use a net um, billing rather than net metering, so a less favorable compensation for rooftop solar in Alberta. Um, you do see, you know, debates happening now in places that have had a lot of rooftop solar about what is a fair compensation and trying to correctly value that. But we're starting from a position of arguably undershooting um, the amount of value that we're giving to people that are putting solar on their rooftops. Um, and that, you know, I think had, um, has, has impacts when it comes to the pace of adoption that we see of that technology here. So look forward to talking about this and, and many more, as well as hearing a bit more about the, the market side that I know Mar Marcus thinks a lot about and, and sort of investors as well, too. Yeah, well, that's super interesting, Sarah, because I know I've only been in this space for three years and I've heard bifacial, bifacial a million times. But I did notice that some of the newcomers to the province who have done solar elsewhere in the world we're a little shocked by the the prevalence of that here so that helps me understand that it's a bit commonplace here but maybe less so or newly adopted elsewhere and um that's really important it's also interesting to hear you say that our um net billing system is a bit of an anomaly that helps me understand better why there's so much confusion um there's a lot of people who seem to think that um everybody else is sort of paying big bucks for rooftop solar in Alberta and that rooftop solar folks aren't paying for their own um, distribution of transmission and that they aren't, uh, you know, uh, that they're getting some kind of deal. And I imagine some of those myths might have started elsewhere where they actually have maybe different billing systems than we do here, because certainly it's not quite as <laughs> advantageous as everybody seems to make it sound. It's really good we can make our money back on our solar um but it's not it's not like the windfall that some people seem, seem to suggest so that that explains a little bit of that sort of myth busting that we constantly have to do here um if we have a different uh, billing system so that's helpful uh so marcus maybe you want to take us uh to to the south and uh, talk a little bit about how it compares I, I remember you once told me that we have a better solar resource here than in Brazil. And I found that a little shocking having never been to South America. So it would be great to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and thanks uh, once again for, for this opportunity. Uh, Sarah, it's, it's, it's really interesting how the Alberta market has, has evolved uh, 
um, not only on the utility scale, but on the uh, distribution side of it. Um, uh, the the bifacials uh, I have I have bifacial ground mount uh, installed and and I was overwhelmingly surprised. I'm going wait a second. I'm producing more in April late uh, beginning of April than I am producing in 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 mid of mid of July because it's simply because of the factor that uh, the snow was the snow was helping me generate much more. So it, it's uh, it's very beneficial to have bifacial in in or ground mounts in the least in in Alberta. So. Uh, definitely. Um, yeah, um, I think Alberta became a, a trendsetter the last few years and, and through work of, of yourselves and Business Renewables Canada and, and sourcing uh, uh, power purchase agreements, uh, getting getting sort of uh, first stage clients to understand about the value of solar and, and the, the carbon credits associated and the like. I think I think there's been Alberta really forged a path, and um, I'm I'm certain we'll def definitely go into the the future of solar and and renewables in Alberta. I'm certain that there there's a really bright future for that uh, in in Alberta. But comparatively, actually, we we're kind of standing still in in some way, shape, or form. Like if if we look at um, if we look at uh, the generation, what you, what's happening around the world, well. Uh, China just installed 180 gigawatts of of solar power just last year. Um, that's almost almost 10 times Alberta Alberta's total installed capacity. So we have we have we have a long way to go. I think we did a we've done a lot of great work, um, but um, we have a long way to go. I can maybe show just what's happened in um, a little bit. What's happened in uh, Latin America is 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 the screen. Um, available is that you can you yeah, see it it looks oh, good great. yeah so this is this this only goes until 2022 um i don't have the the updated one for 2023 uh and you can see some jurisdictions um such as brazil have really taken off and i'll go into more detail on that of installed capacity of utility scale um and others have kind of um uh followed 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 a, a normal path mexico was really really under a, a tremendous boom uh and and they were they were leading what would be the renewable energy path uh in all of latin america until that their uh present government was uh was uh, elected and uh, uh they nationalized basically a a large portion of of the renewable energy capacity that was installed and that just shunned uh, the investment to segment out of the country. So, so policies, policies do matter a lot. Policy really makes a difference on on how these investments uh, get attracted to the jurisdiction. Uh, Brazil, um, I can go through here a little bit. Is uh, here's here's just an overview of Chile's uh, Chile's power demand is um, somewhat uh, in the range of of um, Alberta in that sense. And uh, we have a very large, in, in Chile, there's a very large solar capacity. It would be even more because their capacity factors are, are off the charts, but they don't have the transmission along their 9,000 kilometers of, of coastline that they, have to, that they have to tend to. So it's very difficult to connect all of that solar generation to the demand centers in Santiago and um, and uh, other other uh, port locations, so it's it's um, they're doing their best. Uh, we can go into where the demand will come from uh, as as solar sort of evolves, uh, and there will be tremendous. Um, if we just just a quick mention on on their hydrogen uh, uh, projections, they are looking to install over twenty gigawatts of announced hydrogen uh, electrolysis production and that requires even with a capacity factor of 33 34 that requires almost yeah almost 60 to 70 gigawatts of solar that that should be installed so that will quin uh, that will uh, multiply the solar capacity in chile uh, by by leaps and bounds and here brazil i look at brazil very uh, I, I'm i'm biased i've I, I lived in brazil 25 years and uh, i i do almost a majority of my business uh, in Brazil. 
Um, it's, it's simple. They have embraced solar and renewable capacity with, uh, with fervor. Um, one thing that is very distinguished here in, I'm, I'm actually in Brazil doing uh, uh, on, on business. One thing that really distinguishes it is that the distributed generation capacity in Brazil is three times that of the utility capacity installed. And it has taken off as a, as a rocket. Um, there was there were incentives, so there were no distribution charges on on your on your um, generation capacity uh, for the first up until 2022, and uh, that is now being scaled down over the next five years. Um, but um, it, in essence, when when the market uh, when the association Brazilian Association for uh, Solar, uh, such as Alberta Solar uh, or the the Alberta colleague in Brazil, they made a tremendous effort to lobby the government to make certain that these incentives uh, were maintained for as long as they were. And they've made very clear and articulate point uh, that the distributed generation brings a lot of value above and beyond not only the generation, but the uh, serving as a, as a backup uh, for for brownouts and even blackouts, um, um, the solar Brazil is is very large across the entire uh, continent. Um, uh, Heather, just one comment: it we have better solar um, uh, capacity factor in Alberta compared to Rio de Janeiro, but compared to other uh, northern northeastern portions of Brazil, that capacity factor almost doubles. So so we we still have a little bit. Uh, uh, how should we say, we, we are, we can be a little bit envious of the solar capacity in, in the northeast of Brazil. But that distribution capacity being installed has has become um, the second largest generation capacity of, of all generation capacity. So just in distribution, uh, distributed generation, we're looking at almost 10 to 12 percent of, Brazil, of Brazil's installed capacity on distributed generation. Mm -hmm. So it's an overwhelming uh, important factor in Brazil's overall matrix. And different to Canada, Brazil has an integrated national system. So while there are nodes, regional nodes uh, that have price points, uh, everything is connected. Uh, so um, the hydro is connected with the solar and the wind, and the wind is very forceful as well. Um, so it's been a tremendous boon uh, for the Brazilian economy. The Brazilian economy has been uh, in a doldrum, let's say, for almost 10 years. But the, the solar segment has been, besides the agricultural segment, has been uh, carrying the Brazilian economy on its back. Uh, so over one million people have been employed over the last ten, over the last eight years, and uh, that's a tremendous uh, uh, gain towards the economic uh, benefits of of the economy. So it's it's basically a, a very successful story in Brazil. Um, I think it follows uh, somewhat the the American trajectory of 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 uh, solar capacity. Uh, not as not as much. I, I understand that in the U.S. Even last year, they installed just over 30 gigawatts uh, alone of utility scale. But um, again, Brazil will be uh, embracing this with complete um, complete acceptance across the board. Uh, the policies are in place. Uh, the associations are, are really forcing the issue, make, making certain that uh, the value proposition is, is clear to the policymakers. And um, it, it seems as though the trajectory is is uh, is a nonstop here. If we look at the auctions that sort of that that really enacted this and, and brought it forward for the utility scale, and uh, in 2017, 2018, uh, Brazil had the lowest price auction in the world, uh, reaching at twenty dollars per per megawatt hour of installed capacity, and these were bankable, financeable. Um, um, and power purchase agreements backed by the government uh, that that went through, and um, they were in in how should we say in in 
competition with uh, uh, the Middle East power purchase agreements that were taking place. So we're seeing extremely low price points. We're seeing uh, very effective capacity of, of building this out. And I think that we could uh, replicate that in some ways uh, in Alberta because we have the solar capacity, we have the, the transmission which is necessary. I think that our distribution generation uh, could definitely, if not follow such a trajectory in, in Alberta, I think we could definitely ramp it up much more than, than what is has been uh, going on hitherto. So mm -hmm. yeah, uh, something to think about there. Yeah, that's really interesting. And just for those of you who are on the line who are a little bit less familiar with the language that they're using today, um, utility scale, typically means a solar power plant. So that's when, when we say utility scale, we're often talking about something that's large enough to serve as essentially a power plant. And then when we talk about distributed, often in Alberta, we might say micro generation, we might say rooftop solar, we might say uh, residential and businesses. Um, but Marcus, when you say distributed, what all does that include in, in your mind? And, uh, you know, because I know the language is a little different in Alberta as well sometimes. Yeah, well, and Sarah will be able to um, uh, fill in. But in in a, in the Alberta sense, it's it's whatever's connected to the substation level, and uh, we have I, I believe it's seven seven megawatts of capacity per node uh, that you would be able to build out on a single aspect of of distributed generation, but up to twenty one megawatts of of power onto the substation in and of itself. So. Um, Many other jurisdictions only go on the node of the of the substation. Uh, here in Brazil, distributed generation is only up to five megawatts. It's not considered twenty megawatts of capacity, uh, so embracing the entire substation. Uh, so it's even more incredible that they've built out such a capacity by not having not being able to build out up to twenty megawatts. Mm, interesting, Sarah. Would you mind adding to that if there's any additional local context uh, in terms of the language we're using? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think the language, it, it comes in most importantly, in some sense, in a local context in which rules apply, right? And so there's different rules about who can build and operate plants and how they're compensated based on whether they are um, distributed, you know, behind the fence micro generation, say, um, or utility scale. Um, there's always a bit of an overlap sort of where you have something that could be sized and it could fit under, uh, you know, one, one definition or the other. Um, but I think for those that are sort of thinking about the solar industry or thinking about solar on their own homes, um, you know, it's that distributed and the microgen would be the solar that you're putting on your roof and is um, talking about seeing solar that's, um, you know, those larger farms that are being sold into the grid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know I found that a little confusing at times because we have the small scale generation regulation here in Alberta too, which adds a, a little bit of confusion to the picture. So we are actually going to have a session on that next week at the solar show and the government of Alberta is coming to explain the small scale generation regulation. So if folks are a little confused about some of this language, that would be a good session to come to as well, um, just to take a little bit of a deeper dive into it with us. So this is really helpful. And one of the things that jumped out to me about your graphs is, um, you know, Sarah, the growth you showed here in Alberta was amazing. Um, it was almost straight up <laughs> since 2017. I don't even know if that's a graph or just a line. Um, <laughs> and uh, and yet, I understand that solar makes up only about 5% of Alberta's grid currently. So we are actually the little guy. We're the small, the small uh, player on Alberta's electric um, grid. And yet what Marcus, you were showing us is that in other parts of the Americas, solar makes up a very significant portion of um, the grid uh, in countries that have a similar uh, electrical consumption pattern. And so I found that really fascinating. Um, and I'm wondering if there are best practices that you've noticed for accelerating solar adoption around the Americas that you wish we would adopt in Alberta so we could get beyond that 5% solar mark and, and, and a more uh, resilient and renewable grid as a whole. Um, I know you've touched on a couple of incentive programs that are out there. You mentioned PPAs, which are power purchase agreements, but I, I'm just curious if there are any other really good practices you've seen. Um, obviously not having a moratorium on renewables would be one of them, but uh, <laughs> I suppose beyond that, <laughs> assuming the moratorium comes to an end in February, uh, where, would you, where would you like to see us headed next? Uh, Sarah, well, I, do you I wanna? Think, 
Oh, sorry, Marcus, you go ahead and then we'll go to Sarah. After. Uh, I'll just, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll pass this off to Sarah, who knows much more about uh, about the price points in, in Alberta at the moment. Um, it comes down to price. It's 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 kind of as simple as that. It it's it certainly the industry uh, made a, a concerted effort to to make certain that policies were in place. Or how should we say? Uh, there's a saying here in 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 Brazil, but it 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 applies for all all jurisdictions, but but especially sort of bureaucratic jurisdictions. Just as long as the government doesn't get in the way, then business will will occur. Uh, it's when government says oh, we're here to help that uh, that things sort of <laughs> start to. Um, but it's it's really down to pricing, Heather. Um, uh, the price points of of these um, because when we look at when we look at the aggregated cost, when you take our when you get your power bill, and I'm still I'm still furious. I still fume about it because I'm I'm generating my own power at home, and uh, but I'm still paying transmission and distribution and and administration fees that actually I'm I'm I shouldn't be paying uh to that to that degree or I feel I mean of course I'm biased but um so when when somebody when a small business or a home or a a condominium of of houses is able to generate the majority of their power and not be applied the distribution and transmission charges also because of the incentives which were in place in 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 Brazil but that that happens in China and and was in place in in Mexico um then it just it just makes economic sense to to generate your own um the payback period on on the majority of this of that 30 gigawatts of of power and uh, generation uh, that was in a four to five year payback frame uh, yeah. so there's 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 hardly an investment that you can make that will will make that make that payback right yeah i mean and if you think of of those incentives less as um giving money to those distributed producers and more as incentivizing them to put their own money into <laughs> shifting our future uh it's a very different sort of picture because uh you're basically creating a context whereby a whole bunch of individuals are willing to foot the bill for our energy transition. And that's actually kind of a nice, <laughs> nice thing that you'd think we'd want to encourage. Um, I will say I, I have heard that Alberta is, is far better than other jurisdictions in Canada in terms of uh, incentivizing solar. I hear it is much worse in the other provinces across our country. Um, so I will put that out there. We are host, we're hoping to host a session down the road on the differences across Canada, because I know that um, there are many, but today we're focusing elsewhere and on some of those, uh, those best practices elsewhere. Um, Sarah, do you wanna to pick up on that and talk a little bit about what you, what you wish we had? I've heard, and I don't know if this happens elsewhere here. I've heard that some places in the world, they have no cap on micro generators. So you're not limited by your personal consumption of energy. Mm. Um, you can just maximize your property and put as much solar up as your property can withstand. Is that happening anywhere in the US or the other parts of the Americas where there's no limit on micro generators? Yeah, that's a good a good question. I'm not familiar enough with all the rules to say for sure. I mean, it's definitely not uncommon to have some kind of cap. Sometimes that cap can be a little bit higher. It can be not 100% of your generation, but say 120% or 150%. Um, I think there's good reasons to have a bit of flexibility on that cap if you think about um, you know, a, a neighborhood where you might have a certain homeowner who just has a better, a rooftop that's better situated for solar. Um, and so there's some logic to, you know, having a bit more generation there, say if their next door neighbor can't um, put solar on their roof. Um, but I definitely have my laundry list of, you know, things that I wish that we had in Alberta from a policy perspective. Um, I think we'll talk a little bit later maybe about what's going well. And I think, you know, certainly that that vertical graph um, does, I think, show that there are some things that are that are going well, but there's some um, potential challenges up ahead. And there's some act ways that we could improve the access for more people to to invest in solar. So some big ones on my list are 
thinking ahead about ensuring that we don't end up cutting off the growth that we're seeing of utility scale solar is um, planning our transmission system in a thoughtful way. Um, and so there's a great case study down in Texas where they um, implemented um, uh, I'm, oh gosh, I'm gonna have to remember what the acronym stands for. It's, it goes by CREZ, C-R-E-Z. I think it's Competitive Renewable Energy Zones. Um, but basically they kind of flipped the transmission planning process on its head. And so rather than saying, we're going to um, do the traditional thing, which is really designed much more around kind of large thermal plants, which is to say, you wait until somebody says, I want to build a power generation facility in a certain place. And then the um, regulator decides if it makes sense to build generate or build transmission to that location. What Texas did under CRES was, was sort of a, if you build it, they will come. Let's identify areas that have significant um, renewable generation potential and build out transmission connections to those regions between those uh, good renewable regions and the um, places where we use a lot of power, basically the cities or in Alberta, you know, the cities and the industrial areas. Um, and then they allowed, um, as Texas has similar to us, this competitive market for generators to then um, decide to locate projects there and connect to that transmission. Um, so I think that, you know, we haven't yet run into this in uh, this sort of transmission constraint. And you see that in, you know, the fact that our um, uh, solar installations are growing in the province, but that is something that we will hit eventually. And it would be great to plan ahead for that. So we don't have that problem. Um, yeah, well, I've, I've absolutely heard about it though, Sarah. Like I have, I have heard about people trying to go ahead with a community generation initiative um, of two megawatts. Uh, in a part of rural Alberta that did not have the capacity to receive what they wanted to offer. And so uh, because they couldn't receive two megawatts in that location, the project didn't go, go ahead, even though it was incredible uh, potential for solar power generation there. So it, I think your point is really taken because it is already happening here and you know our members are experiencing that. So. Um, I had no idea there were jurisdictions saying, you know, let's build it out and then they'll come. That's really cool. Thank you for sharing that. What else were yeah. you thinking about there? Um, well, then thinking more on the, um, I've sort of two more, two more buckets of my wish list. Um, <laughs> thinking more on the distributed side and the rooftop solar. One which I touched on earlier is, you know, um, implementing more sophisticated value of solar tariffs. So that's, you know, that we have this um, net um, billing tariff that arguably undervalues um, the solar that, that people are putting on the grid. I think there, it is fair to say that when you have a lot of solar penetration, like you're starting to see in places like California and others, uh, net metering probably overvalues that. And there probably is some, you know, fair fairness to a claim that, that people are being overcompensated for solar on their roof. And so what some jurisdictions are doing is trying to move to a more sophisticated value of solar tariff, where you're actually trying to better estimate what is the real value, both of the generation, but also of say, avoiding um, maybe build out of, of uh, distribution infrastructure and providing that as the compensation to those who are installing solar. Um, so that's one on my kind of distributed wish list. The other one is really around enabling broader participation in the distributed solar market. So another um, thing that we've seen um, be very successful in some other jurisdictions is uh, is so-called virtual net um, net metering or net billing. So basically, um, if you have solar on your roof of the home that you own, you know that you can um, use that to offset your your um, consumption and, and sell back to the grid. Um, what you can't do is sort of buy into your neighbor's system or, or, or buy into a community system. There are some ways that you can do that in Alberta, but they are more complicated than in other places. And that's because we don't have this ability to do this so-called so virtual um, net metering or net billing. Um, and that really opens up a lot of opportunities for people to, um, maybe their roof isn't well suited for solar, maybe they don't own their home, um, maybe they don't um, you know, have the, the resources or don't want to purchase a whole solar system, but want to buy just part of one. And so um, that's a way that, that um, we can really open up access to more people. There are solar co-ops, which are you know, sort of trying to use the rules that we have in Alberta that enable this kind of joint participation, but the, it, it's a much more complicated process than if you have this direct virtual um, net net metering or net billing. Um, so so on another one on the on the kind of distributed level side that would be great to see. 
Um, and then the last one is really thinking ahead, you know, when I look at what other jurisdictions are doing that are have more solar than us. So again, planning for that future when hopefully um, because solar costs are have fallen and continue to fall that we'll see more solar. It's making sure that we're really able to um, take advantage of things like demand response and more batteries on our system. Um, and, and so there is um, the ability to basically get people to use more energy in their homes or in their businesses at times when that that power is cheaper. So if you have a lot of solar, then you're going to have you know more power during the day in the middle of the day that's going to be lower cost. Um, and so having tariffs that allow people to use that power to charge their car or to pre cool their homes in ways that um, is kind of a win win because you're basically using more of that power you're making that power more valuable while saving people money. Um, and so again sort of planning ahead we're not there yet right now the the value of our solar kind of midday in the summer um, is actually helping us to avoid very expensive alternatives that we would be using in alberta um, but if we start to see adoption of solar creep up um, there'll be some opportunities there so starting to lay the groundwork to make that happen as well mm, yeah that's really important and that is something like the whole demand side management piece uh, is something that we're really also pushing for with the province right now because we have heard word that in March they're going to be doing some new um, uh, electricity uh, legislation and you know we're hoping we can see some of those smart approaches being adopted so that we're all you know charging our electric vehicles at the best time of day especially if we have solar and it's interesting because the best time of day actually differs depending on whether you have solar or don't because uh, I was chatting with an EV owner who doesn't have solar and of course it's ideal if they're charging you know um, uh, when it's not sunny out so not around dinner time or what have you <laughs> um, but for me because I have solar it's better if I charge when the sun is out so even if that is dinner time um, often that means I'm pulling from my own system instead of the grid so totally interesting to think about how those incentives also have to work differently depending on whether someone has solar or not too so uh, lots of good food for thought. Hopefully Alberta is ready to take the plunge into some of those smart conversations. And, um, and I also um, appreciate your comments on the virtual net billing because we actually have two members who have been developing creative approaches <laughs> here in Alberta. And I remember when I first started here at Solar Alberta, I heard we didn't have virtual net billing, virtual net metering. It was a huge problem. It still is, um, but yeah, the the co-ops like Spice and Bow Valley have really um, just tried to uh, find an Alberta solution to that. So we have actually a new web page right now. It's uh, investing in solar for people who have already finished their own roof or don't have a solar appropriate roof. They can go and invest in these co-ops and essentially make money by putting solar on other people's roofs. Um, but you're right about the work. It has taken them a lot of time and energy to try and find a way to move that forward. And of course, uh, it's still cost prohibitive for lower income folks and middle income folks. And so we need to find a solution for that. And the virtual net billing and metering uh, is uh, definitely more accessible. So um, thank you for bringing that up. I know we want to get to everybody else's questions and I see folks are starting to populate the chat. So what I'd like you to do is if everybody could start putting their questions in the Q&A, I'm going to ask one more question for Marcus and Sarah, and then we're going to start diving into some of yours with our last, um, I guess, uh, 40 minutes or so here. Um, so I guess my last question for you two before we jump into others is we've talked about best practices elsewhere that could be adopted here and your lists were awesome. Um, what do you think are some of the best practices we have that other jurisdictions should consider because, uh, you know, as Sarah's graph showed, we are doing something right, at least in the last oh six years, we've been doing something right. Um, and so, you know, what is it that's that's working here? And especially um, for anyone who's tuning in from other parts of Canada, they'll probably be very curious about that question. Uh, so, and, and what are people coming here to learn about? Because there are probably people, you know, I've, I've met folks from the US who tune into our shows. I've met folks from South America who tune into our, our sessions. So they're, they're coming to learn about something here. Um, and, and what is it that they're interested in? Um, Marcus, do you want to kick us off with that one? Sure. No, that, that's great. And, and there's, it, it's such a dynamic segment. We are experiencing probably one of the most, how should we say, the, the most impactful uh, transitions, uh, economic transitions in 
in in history uh i mean i think it's even bigger than the industrial revolution because we are going through this entire transition from how to we how do we create a a a a clean footprint energy uh, segment and energy uh, sector throughout the world. So there's so many things to take into consideration. What Sarah was mentioning about uh, all of these, um, um, the the storage capacity and and the the differentiation of of distributed uh, capacity to to bring that onto the to the to the to the grid. I I believe that storage is a, a great, important, and fundamental aspect that that will have to be addressed. I know that ASO is is going through the going through the the measures right now. But what we do in Alberta of great of how should we say uh, of value that that I think is that can be uh, translated to other jurisdictions. We have an uh, we have an incredible environmental track record. Our our even though it it uh, may may be sort of uh, un, uh, under misunderstood, uh, Alberta has a very robust um, environmental process of application process. Um, sometimes a bit too inhibitive, but when when we look at the overall macro scope of uh, energy generation, I think it's I think it's well well suited that we have to go through these these uh, environmental um and due diligence to make certain that we are we are doing things properly um now the the other thing that we do that we do well and this is very contentious is carbon pricing uh um, it does provide a bonus it does provide a benefit for clean or, or renewable or low carbon generation to uh, sort of kickstart it and then give it that little cherry on the top it 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 shouldn't be a it shouldn't be a whole embracing sort of incentive where without it the the financial model is not uh, possible but with it it just gives that little cherry on top for the investors to say okay we we're going to choose alberta rather than some other jurisdiction I know it's contentious, and I know there's a lot of moving parts to it, but uh, it it does it did make it does move the needle for for larger investors. Yeah, and at the smaller scale, I would say the fact that we have the opportunity for solar specific pricing in Alberta is sort of the the micro generator cherry on top. Like the solar system makes sense, regardless. I mean, it makes economic sense, but your payback time could come down a little bit if you opt into a solar specific pricing program, uh, which some of our members offer. And so, um, it, again, it's it's a bit contentious. Some people don't like that that's available in Alberta. Um, but I personally love it because it's just a little extra incentive in a system that is actually lacking in a lot of incentives. Um, so, you know, for me, it's sort of the equivalent to our, you know, utility scale carbon pricing cherry on top. And um, it, it kind of pushes people over who might not otherwise take the plunge. How about you, Sarah? What are you thinking about that that is re really nice here that you're proud of? Sure. Yeah. And I just wanted to comment on that pricing piece, because actually that's another one. Not I mean, I think to, to go into all the details would take a more time that we have left and, and a whole uh, lecture on um, the way our electricity market works. But that's another one that right now, the fact that, you know, you can opt into a, a price where you receive more for your solar in the summertime um, is not a sort of special incentive or there, it's not a subsidy that's coming from government. What's really happening is that owners of solar systems are being given access to a portion of the higher value that the solar generation provides. And what that really is, um, maybe the most, the most direct way to explain it is that solar right now in Alberta, because we have relatively little of it, is generating at times when power is very expensive, more expensive than on average. Um, it's generating at times um, in the summer, you know, most in the summer. Um, and when is it sunny? Well, it also tends to be hot and we're seeing a lot more air conditioning use. We have um, our thermal plants operate at lower efficiency. And so um, the fact that you can kind of get this higher value, um, as I said, is, is actually a portion of it doesn't really, you, you can kind of do the math and it doesn't even quite um, uh, provide the full value that, that that solar is providing to the system. Um, but I think it's another great example of, you know, as Marcus was sort of saying, as the costs come down, it's not that even there necessarily has to be a lot of special incentives. It's just simply that this becomes more economic 
Um, but some of the other things, um, you know, definitely agree with the point on, on carbon pricing. Um, certainly also the fact that we have a market that allows for power purchase agreements to be um, uh, made, um, you know, makes a big difference. If you look at Alberta versus Saskatchewan, not so different from a solar resource um, perspective, not so different from a grid perspective, um, but we have a lot of solar that's been installed here um, while there's been very limited utility scale development in, in Saskatchewan. And that really comes down, I, I would ascribe it primarily to being able to uh, sign these deals, these, these uh, virtual PPAs um, with companies. Um, the other one that, that I would say is quite important in, in really kind of kickstarting that um, period of growth that, um, that I showed at the beginning um, was a procurement that the government of Alberta did back um, a couple, quite a few years ago now. Um, it was a follow on to the renewable energy procurement that ASO ran that was um, where we saw those wind projects that were developed The um, Alberta infrastructure, I believe it was ran a solar specific one for their own solar needs. And I think it's fair to say that that process which really encouraged um, sort of early stage development of solar farms as well as um, had an element of so called price discovery basically they published you know some information about the cost. Um, really helped to kind of um, seed the market for those those um, commercial PPAs that we're seeing as well too. So I think that's a great example of um, you know what I would what I would say is really good government public policy that um, is uh, helping to stimulate the, the creation of a market not with subsidies and in fact that deal um, you know will have returned actually value to uh, the government of Alberta and, and through that to Albertan um, uh, people that live here and pay taxes here. Um, so it's it's a good example of um, the idea that you might need some kind of government intervention but that intervention doesn't necessarily have to come at a cost and it can design well it can even come at a benefit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes I remember that being quite a game changer and um, it's it's definitely opened up a lot of space that we didn't have before uh i'm one of the few albertans who was born and raised here so i have the had the pleasure of really noticing a lot of those changes that you show on the graphs and you know those uh shifts in our society uh you know are really part of what even attracted me to the solar sector is i thought oh things are moving here so uh you're right it's it is there are there is a role for government um it's just a question of what it is right so um, questions from our audience. So Justin is, uh, is asking a question to you, Marcus. Um, the model you showed of Latin America, are these installed gigawatts generally new generation or replacement generation for retiring fossil fuel generation? These are, these are new generation. Uh, fossil fuel um, or thermal, thermal assets are, are are being contracted as well, but not nearly at the rate of of the uh, government backed power purchase agreements. Uh, those in both in Chile and um, and in Brazil, those are the two jurisdictions I'm, I'm more aligned with. Uh, those power those procurements have ceased. So it is it is the open market. It is the merchant market that is uh, procuring these uh, this generation, and it is all new build because mm -hmm. because of the growing factor or the growing economic uh, capacity of the of the jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. And also, they're probably seeing some of the electrification that we're starting to see here in Alberta, where more and more folks are adopting um, electric appliances and vehicles, and so there's you're just going to need more and more. <laughs> uh supply in general hey yeah no interesting um tyler is wondering is there a concern that as utility scale pv production increases will the increased generation decrease the daily average price that projects earn and hinder the return on investment potential for future projects that's a good question uh yeah curious sarah do you want to take a stab at that one yeah, this is a great question. That's a great explanation of what does happen. And, and in a way that sort of um, the feedback loop that the market is supposed to have, that is, you know, if you have more solar during the day, um, then all else being equal, it becomes less valuable because you have more of it. It matters very much what regime you're in. And as I was saying, we're still, um, I guess we'll see what, what next summer looks like. But this summer we were still, uh, last summer we were still in a regime where that solar was actually more valuable 
um, because it depends on that supply balance between the solar and in particular in Alberta, we're sort of we're having more solar installed, but we're also seeing more demand in summer days, um, more use of air conditioners, um, more installations of residential air conditioners to cope with um, summers that are getting hotter and, and unfortunately more smoky. And so I think, you know, it's, it's hard to predict exactly when we're going to see that um, kind of val sometimes people call it like value cannibalization. Um, one of the things that, um, and, and that's where there's some other opportunities to deal with that, right? So one is having battery storage so that you're able to kind of stretch out and flatten that um, supply. That is something that's very helpful that helps to preserve that value. The other is that demand response that we were talking about. So being able to move more demand to the, the middle of the day. Um, the other piece that you know I think helps in the in the near term is that for projects that are being built, um, you know if you are as costs come down, they are able to then recover more of their value um, in a shorter period of time, so they don't have to worry so much about what's happening you know many years from now. Um, and as costs are low overall, you again have this sort of race between the value or the price that you're receiving from the market potentially going down. But of course, if your cost of generation um, of a new solar farm goes down, then then you're able to continue to build those. So definitely that is, you know, the, you know, correct way to characterize what happens is you get more solar coming online, but there's some other factors that are going to help to kind of delay that um, uh, and, and push it out kind of to the future. So it's not something that I think we're going to see in the very, very near term um, in, uh, in Alberta. We're not going to see that line start to, <laughs> just kidding, it's a capacity line, it'll never go down. <laughs> Although, the, the stuff on the queue did, I noticed um, in, in August, but anyways, um, I'm just wondering uh, also when you spoke, say, uh, thermal plants, you mean like coal plants, natural gas plants, it's just a language I'm not sure if everyone's familiar yeah, with. But. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for that. Thermal plants as shorthand for power generation plants that generate their power from thermal, you know, from thermal energy, basically. So burning something and converting that um, mm -hmm. steam into electricity. Okay, okay. Um, and Gary says that one of the questions that many power consumers have is, are the renewable power sources paying their fair, sh fair share of transmission costs? Uh, I think you touched on that a little bit, but the case is made that solar systems are designed for peak loads over a period of say four to 16 hours and minimal loads over the balance of the day. This is an issue that was mentioned during the, AUC, the current AUC process. Um, so I guess, I guess just looking for comment on that, uh, if you have one. That's, a, that's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very difficult question because, um, in, in essence, every electron that goes through the transmission grid is paying, is paying its way across there. Now, what time of day is it paying and, and how is that allocation of the mass of electrons through the through the time of day? Uh, how is that valued or is how is that that cost analysis put put onto a transmission um, uh, provider? Um, again, we are in especially in in Alberta, in other jurisdictions such as uh, Australia and California uh, are, are really tweaking these system operations costs and, and, and benefits with energy storage. And they have price points in the energy storage and that provides, how should we say, a, a, more, a more viable investment thesis for a longer term um, generation. Um, yeah. It, I'm I'm not I'm not an economist, uh, perhaps as as uh, nowhere near uh, well versed as as Sarah. But the 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 investment thesis around it is that we have to be able to get the lowest cost of energy generation possible, and now delay it over time. And then how we can apply that into the transmission system? That's a different that's a different economic uh, decision. Yes, I actually will refer the audience as well to our seminar series kickoff from January last year, uh, where we will we were looking at the impact of solar on the grid and Tim Weiss and Alicia Coteau were chatting and it was very interesting for me to learn that solar is so low cost and that because it doesn't there's nobody operating a solar plant, <laughs> you know, a solar farm doesn't require a lot of operations 
uh, like a thermal plant would. Therefore, you can produce energy over long term at a lower cost. And so that's really beneficial um, and drives the price down for everybody in some ways. And so I see why it's a complicated answer, um, because in many ways, what they, were, what they were saying last January is there there's good reason to drive the price of energy uh, or electricity down using more solar because it's so low cost to operate. Um, yeah, Sarah, do you want to comment on that as well? Yeah, I mean, I think I'll, I'll sort of take this question as a chance to sort of talk a little bit about the big picture that sits behind it, right, which is um, the the way the rules that we have that govern our electricity system today and the way that we assign costs were all designed around a certain type of generation and load, right, so that was all designed around these big um, plant coal natural gas plants that generate in a certain way and have certain properties, especially um, you know on the on the coal side that maybe they're harder to ramp up and down. Um, and it was designed for uh, demand that is you know relatively um, uncontrollable that is you know there wasn't much that system operators could do for many years to change. Um, the amount of demand that that different um, individuals or, or sort of the combined set of individuals would have and so it's very easy to sort of zero in on one specific piece and sort of say well you know how does solar like we're not properly accounting for a certain set of costs or as you say benefits as well um, within the market and it, i think that reflects sort of a broader piece of if as we bring on a little bit of a new type of generation that, that is very different um, you can kind of tweak the rules and sort of figure out how to fit it in but increasingly, as we move towards grids that look very different, that have very different sources of energy, where we have uses of energy where it's much easier to, again, potentially control them, you know, imagine what the ability for um, kind of the Internet of Things or even just sort of automation on our systems are, you know, historically, if system operators were going to try to get everybody to turn their um, hot water, uh, electric hot water tank on at the same time, they would have had to call up every Albertan, right, and tell them to go flick a switch. Um, and, you know, obviously we live in a very different time now. And so what that means and what I think the, the community of researchers that study sort of the most efficient market and, and grid designs are coming to is that we really need to think about some bigger fundamental changes in the way that we assign these costs and benefits and trying to do them piecemeal um, you know, just to, to kind of pick one example on the on the other side, if you want, there is a product um, or a service in the electricity market that we um, a system operator procures that basically takes into account the fact that a large thermal plant can fail at any time. Right. And, and so that is a certain risk to the system and a grid operator needs to have the ability to respond to a 300 megawatt plant coming offline with absolutely essentially no warning. Um, that is a different kind of challenge right than renewables where solar, um, you know, certainly as people on the Internet never tire of reminding me does not <laughs> the sun does not shine all night. Thank you. Uh, folks for, for reminding me of that um, and that that is a challenge, but it's a different challenge and, and it. It's a predictable kind of predictable challenge. Cost. It's a predictable challenge. So as you can see, in some ways it's harder because you know every night you're going to have to deal with it. But in some ways it's actually easier in that you know I'm not aware at least of of times where there is sort of a surprise that very very large solar plants go offline. Um, you know, typically with a solar eclipse we know about it, and even we we're aware <laughs> of the potential for for cloud cover to impact solar generation. Mm -hmm. And so I put forward that example not to sort of then say well. You know this is unfair because now we're pay paying for all this um, insurance you know solar is paying for all the insurance of the of the big thermal plants but just to show that you know to to kind of narrow in and pick one specific situation usually misses kind of the system overall as a whole and Broader so picture. um you know that's where when we think about answering some of these questions the first part of my answer would be that you know if you're talking about relatively low levels of penetration of solar then all of those impacts are going to be pretty small and and for now you know we're we're using the transmission system to send solar during the hot parts of the day when we actually need more power anyway so so it's not the case that this is sort of using something and other, a bunch of other times it should be there um 
then when you start to get a lot more of solar, say, so that you're seeing, you know, more than you need, say, in the middle of the day, um, the answer is to then think about these more fundamental redesigns of the pricing system, rather than trying to assign sort of a specific cost. It's almost like a band-aid solution, right? That where you're sort of trying to continue to fix your system. And at some point, we're going to have to start looking at a more um, fundamental shift to the way that we think about costs and, and assigning those uh, within our electricity grid. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I know there are a lot of myths out there that need to be addressed as well. Um, we have some members who recently met with a, a designated a designate of the minister or a designate of the premier, I can't remember which. Um, and the number one thing that <laughs> they started with was um, the misunderstanding within a senior levels of government, thinking that when solar farms come online, that the ratepayer pays uh, for their connection. And our members were like, no, no, the repair does not pay for that connection. And, and, and there are people imposing a moratorium who thought uh, that the ratepayer was paying for the connection of the solar farm. And I was like, oh my gosh, that is a really problematic misunderstanding of costs of transmission and distribution. So um, it's really important that we get at these, at these issues because there's some misunderstandings that you know are leading to uh, catastrophic outcomes uh, really when the wrong people um, are making decisions about things they don't know about so um, so I appreciate you two taking the time to clear up some of the misunderstandings today because <laughs> hopefully we've got 60 people on the line who can help us um, spread the word that you know the solar farms and others are not um, you know here to um, impose massive costs on society. <laughs> That's not really what they're all about. I've got a comment here from one of our uh, listeners. Uh, when when he was when they were doing a project uh, in their second year of solar energy with uh, Robert Barron, who's um, actually uh, also a teacher for us uh, and at Lakeland, um, they investigated BC Hydro. When you click on the website to show the bill, they try relative ineffectively to explain their different charges but they also put in there that they're trying to challenge in the courts to be able to charge more for various things not less a person could spend eight hours researching each aspect of how bc hydro for example feels they can charge each person for transmission distribution and other factors as well um, they have quite a monopoly so uh, i don't know much about bc hydro myself like other than i know they're they're not allowing for any solar farm development in BC because they have a lot of electricity already. Um, maybe you two wanna comment a little bit on the BC context, I'm not sure. Feel free to jump in if you do. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I mean, will, I guess maybe the- let, let Sarah kind of <laughs> I'll, I'll not try to comment on all of it in there, but I, I will say um, <clears throat> that I think that there are opportunities to, um, again, make changes when it comes to the, the, the so-called demand side management, right? And, and sort of have programs that basically allow people to, um, when they can be flexible with certain parts of their electricity demand. In a, and ideally that's done in a way that is not punitive. You're not increasing costs for people, but you're really finding ways for them to reduce their costs where it lines up with what you need for the electricity grid. So that would be um, allowing people to move, you know, to do run their dishwasher or their washing machine and dryer um, overnight. Um, you know, if that if that's not inconvenient for them, um, and to be compensated for that. Um, and so there's a lot of kind of thinking about making sure that that's done in a way that you know is is a benefit and not a cost. Um, but again, is, as long as I think you're you're careful about that going into it. Um, that is that is possible. Mm -hmm. It's, no, sort, of the, uh, mm -hmm, it's sort of the the age old uh, uh, predicament of uh, whether to use a carrot or or a <laughs> stick, um, and uh, we see this, of course, in in the hydrogen uh, sector very well. Um, it seems to be that the carrot is 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 a more is a more effective manner, uh, but. Um, one of the things you see it also within the solar in in the Canadian context, I didn't quite go into the details of it, but from what I understand, Ontario is now reconsidering its renewable energy policies uh, simply because you cannot keep renewable energy off the grid anymore. It's it's not it is not viable in the long run to keep these cheap electrons off of the 
off of the uh, in, in electric uh, systems operations. Mm -hmm. It's coming. And, and I think that's part of why, um, I guess when the moratorium was imposed in Alberta on renewable power plants, I sort of thought everybody would freak out and some people didn't freak out. And um, I think the reason that some people didn't freak out is because they're sort of seeing the long game and they're saying, this is just a blip that in the long run, uh, you know, you, you know, this is happening, uh, whether some people like it or not. So, um, you know, they're seeing it as more of a, a minor inconvenience for a short time. Uh, we'll overcome this. It's kind of the last gasp of the, of the thermal, <laughs> the last thermal power plant gasp. <laughs> so anyways, they're, they're not as riled up as I am, but um, I guess I, my job is to take issue with anything like that. So I am particularly motivated to care, but also another question here from Brent. Um, any comments on opportunities for virtual power purchase uh, agreements in Alberta or Canada for residential PV systems? There's a lot of chatter in other jurisdictions. You know, I have to admit, I. I sort of feel like it is the Alberta way to just make a deal with your neighbor. Like, I don't think there's really anything, you know, stopping Albertans from just dra drafting up a contract with their neighbor and, <laughs> and setting up their own little virtual power purchase agreement. But uh, maybe I'm totally off topic here. What are your two thoughts on this subject? That's an interesting question. I mean, I think the biggest challenge would be the size of the system, right? And that idea that you can't go over your electricity demand um, within that, I suppose you could could share with your neighbor. I think I, I'm not a lawyer, obviously, so don't, <laughs> don't take this as legal advice that this is what you're allowed to do. Um, but I think it would be, yeah, it would be great to see, you know, just a rule change that allows for that. I'm not aware of um, any discussions that are ongoing about putting that into place, but um, there may be, um, there may be some, it would be, it would be good to have, it would just add that flexibility, like we talked about, especially for um, those that, you know, don't own a home or, or want to kind of buy into a smaller amount of a solar system. Mm -hmm. One, I, uh, one item uh, that is, is uh, in place here in Brazil is, is bundling of these uh, smaller distributed assets. And uh, uh, there are, because <clears throat> before just prior, even last year, uh, the you were only allowed to go onto the merchant market if you had a certain amount of of consumption. Uh, that is now being eliminated over time, so anybody can go onto the market and purchase a virtual uh, power uh, power purchase agreement. Um, but it doesn't make any viable sense to do that on a small scale. You have to you have to have a certain critical mass to be able to make it. Uh, there's administrative capacity there's administration involved in it there's there's all types of things so a number of companies have arisen in brazil that are bundling all of these generation smaller distribution and micro micro and microgrid uh, uh, generation assets into a package and then making it av available for investors or uh, homeowners themselves that don't have the capacity to uh, place it on their own um, their own um, uh, uh, land or, or jurisdiction that they can then buy into that uh, and and create a bit of value for themselves through that. So it's it's becoming very very prevalent. It it will be taking over. Uh, I think it will be the second wave of distributed generation uh, expansion in in this jurisdiction. Interesting. Apparently, I misread Brent's question. He meant virtual power plants uh, instead of virtual power purchase agreements. So that uh, that is different. Sorry about that. I'm I'm not great with my acronyms. So <laughs> I did warn I warned Sarah and Marcus before we started. I said, by the way, I'm not great with my acronyms. <laughs> um, did either of you want to comment further on that with respect to virtual power plants? I can say a little bit about what what sort of the challenge in Alberta um, and yeah I think that's it's a great example of it's, it's the same acronym that means two different things. Um, well there definitely. was an A missing I, I, I didn't catch the A that was missing I just assumed it was an accident. <laughs> definitely some challenges there. Um, so I mean I think one of the this comes back to some of those demand response programs that I was talking about right and one of the challenges right now in Alberta is that we don't generally have information about when people are um, using power. Um, as an individual right we don't have a, a so called smart meter that allows you to track or allows your utility to track 
the time of your consumption, just the total amount. Um, and so there would need to be some changes there, whether it's the installation of a um, smart meter that allows for that kind of tracking or actually potentially you, um, allowing for utilities to use other kinds of um, devices other than the meter um, to, um, to, to kind of track time of use. Um, that there seems to be some companies that are at least um, having some offerings that I that I've heard about coming to the market and I'm actually not exactly sure about how they're sort of getting around that whether it's they are um, internally using um, some of their own tracking then that they're going to kind of then settle up on the basis of that um, but that that is again sort of all, all I would put all these things in this bucket of it would be great for us to be thinking about you know changing the rules to allow for these kinds of things to happen um, at the at the utility commission level mm -hmm. interesting um, there is a question here about career opportunities for um, uh, bilingual folks and whatnot I, I suspect this is more for you Marcus and uh, it's it's very uh, specific. So what I would ask is Sarah and Marcus, if either of you are willing to kind of um, share your email or contact information in the chat, uh, if people have like, you know, specific questions for you about career paths and things of that nature. Um, it would be amazing if you could pop that in the chat, but no pressure if you're not able to. Uh, I understand not everybody can share their personal information these days because I know <laughs> that can go haywire quickly. Um, but if you are open to that, there is a question here that's very um, personal and specific that I think uh, would appreciate contact info. Um, okay, great. So another topic, uh, which you've touched on actually with respect to the economics, but we haven't talked a little bit about fairness. So can you identify the important policies the Alberta government should implement to make solar power generation consumption more fair and more economical? Um, we've talked about incentives. We've talked about some of the good things that are happening with solar specific pricing. Um, at the micro generation level with, you know, homes and businesses, um, I guess, are there any others that you'd like to add to the mix? Uh, and in particular, anything that you think would really make it more fair? Because a common criticism that I think we've all heard is that solar and EVs are for the wealthy and they're not really accessible to everybody. And I mean, it's not just something we hear, it is something we witness. And that is something we're trying to overcome here at Solar Alberta. So um, if you had to pick some policies that you think make solar more accessible and welcome more Albertans into the mix, uh, what would those be? Um, I will, I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, butt in here quickly. Uh, it's it's more of, of a philosophical uh, perspective at the moment, and I'll try to uh, dig down into uh, what, what fairness policies, but uh, when we look at renewable energy generation, it is the most independent and democratic uh, force, source of, of power that exists in the world. You don't need to be a multinational company that has billions of dollars on its asset, on its balance sheet to go out and start generating your own energy. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a, a generator. I generate my own power. I live in the land of the free and the proud in Alberta, Canada. And I am very, very proud to be energy independent. And I think that's something that is uh, sort of mistaken in all of the context and all of the dialogue is we are we are not understanding how liberating it is to be able to generate your own power and create value for yourselves as an individual. Um, now, how that's I think that that's fair in and of itself. But the policies that that surround it, um, I think that there has to be uh, the, the 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 policymakers have to understand the value that is brought to this the overall economic um, discussion is that you generate jobs, you generate wealth, you generate independence, you generate a a uh, a market which is dynamic. And uh, there's a lot, there's a, as Sarah mentioned, there's a lot that has to be done. It's not, it's, we're not going through an easy process. We're not saying that, oh, we can resolve this in one day. It's, it's a very lengthy discussion and we have to engage everybody. Um, but it is of, of essential, uh, of essence that policymakers understand the, that this is a, this is a this is a a, a truly liberating experience uh, across the board for for all economic uh, uh, factors in in the economy. 
it's really interesting to hear you comparing it to other types of power production. So from that perspective, it's extraordinarily fair, even though it can cost, you know, 15 to 25 grand. I think the way a lot of people are thinking about the unfairness is more with respect to do they have personally 15 to 25 grand. And so um, it is interesting to hear you speak about it in a, in a diff with a different lens. I appreciate that because, um, you know, uh, most of us can't buy <laughs> a coal power plant. So I hadn't really thought of that context before. Um, are we comparing apples to apples, right? Uh, and, and a lot of us are just thinking, you know, can, can I afford to have solar? We're not necessarily thinking, uh, can I afford to have power generation in general? Um, in that sense, it's very affordable. But uh, if you do talk to individuals, as many of our members do, um, and they don't have the 15 to 25 grand, um, that can be really frustrating for them. So I am curious, Sarah, if you have anything you want to add there on, on that topic, because I think Marcus has presented a very important macro perspective on that. But uh, maybe to dive a little more into the specifics, would you want to touch on that? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think there's different things governments can do, and we've seen some of those happen in uh, Alberta and in Canada. So providing um, ways that people can get loans and in particular um, loans at low rates to pay for a solar system. Obviously, again, this is usually limited to people that own their own home. So that is still a kind of limiting factor. Um, but things like the, I know the city of Calgary, I believe uh, city of Edmonton and some other cities across Alberta have set up um, uh, structure where you can um, basically take a loan and is tied to your property taxes. That's something that we've seen in other jurisdictions. Um, I believe that there's a federal um, also low interest grant program that goes along with the Greener Homes direct granting, um, or sorry, I should say low interest loan program. So finding ways that people can kind of access those larger amounts of capital, larger amounts of money that you might need to pay up front um, that for a system that they can pay back over time, that's one way. Um, the other not to, you know, <laughs> keep beating the source, but the but the community solar um, is a really good way again to sort of allow people to to make investments that are smaller and maybe more in line with the the um, kind of size of investment that they want to make. I'll also say that there are really great examples um, of uh, different jurisdictions actually making then requirements. Um, this this is one is a few years ago now, but to give people an example, they can look up. I believe it was in Colorado um, where they actually just had a mandate that a certain percentage of the um, participants in a community solar project had to be low income participants. Um, and I think that's another really great place for, um, you know, government policy to step in and say, especially if there's supports coming in the form of um, now we have, you know, the federal um, investment tax credit, for example, for solar, um, that those can come with the strings attached that that there is a certain uh, percentage of participants, um, economic participants that, that come from diverse sets of um, background, in that case, income uh, income testing. Um, so I think that's a, a key role for public policymakers to be thinking about how to make those as inclusive as possible. Um, and that community generation really does open that up because it just allows for, um, you know, that, that smaller and, and broader access. Yeah, and I feel like I almost planted whoever asked that last question because, you know, we are big proponents of the Clean Energy Improvement Program. And one nice thing about that municipal program with low interest financing that you mentioned is you can use it for secondary properties. So we are actually exploring, uh, we do rent a townhome to a friend of ours, and we are exploring putting solar up to reduce her uh, electricity costs. And so, you know, that is becoming an option. So renters can start working with um, their landlords to apply for the municipal clean energy improvement program and our letter to the feds about the clean and uh, about the greener homes grant actually asks that they allow for secondary properties, not so that landlords can benefit, but so that renters can benefit because the 0% loan that you mentioned federally right now, unfortunately only applies to homeowners on their primary property. And so no renters will ever benefit from that. And that is not okay. So we are advocating for a couple of these just uh, energy transition pieces that Sarah's touched on. Um, so just a, a shout out for our, uh, folks to send some of those template letters again that we have on, on our website to advocate with us. We are at 1329. We have picked your brains for an hour and a half. This is a dream for me. I really appreciate you both taking the time. 
Um, it, it always feels like um, whenever I listen to you on a podcast, Sarah, I never hear enough from you. So I'm always like, oh, I just have to um, be able to get her in a room for an hour and a half. And Marcus, I served on the board with you, but we were so busy talking about governance. We never got to talk and pick your brain. So this has been really a dream. So thank you both very much uh, for making this happen and making the time. I want to give a, a huge shout out, of course, to our sponsor, Firefly. And, and Kyle, thank you for joining us today again. Um, we really couldn't do this without you.